Mike Powers, TK interview, roll one, see one, take one. What's poppin' is your boy Mike Powers. What's poppin' is your boy Mike Powers, live and direct from Transition Studios in Cleveland. I told you about that, so when you stop in Cleveland, you already know I got you. Shout to the crew, wonderful crew here, Lito, Andrew, and Mark, and of course, shout to my man, Sean. Now, let's get to it. For my real hip-hop heads only, my next guest and first comedian on this platform comes to us from Compton by way of Dirty Jurors. His resume is as expansive as his intellect, and neither is looking to fall off anytime soon. A veteran with over 30 years of experience gracing stages and screens around the world, this inimitable master of his craft may right now be in more demand than at any other time in his career. Bearing this knowledge, we here at the Mike Power Show are grateful for the presence of a true living legend and a man whose work wears the distinction of timelessness. Ladies and gentlemen, for the first time on the Mike Power Show, the one and only gangster of comedy, T.K. Kirkland, is in the building. <laughs> What an intro. <laughs> I feel psyched, yes. TK, thank you for joining us. Hey, we had a, quite the adventure uh, over the past couple of days. I feel like I almost died coming to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but you're just dramatic, though. You know what I'm saying? That's uh, I, just, I, I, I really enjoyed the, um, the snow and um, living life on a little edge a little bit with the snow and not knowing what was going to happen. But what he says, ladies and gentlemen, is true. He really felt they didn't make it. And it's due to the fact that he didn't have snow tires. <laughs> you know, we was, we, was, we, was, we was riding, and he didn't have the proper snow tires. And I explained to him what was going on. But I truly enjoyed it. It was, it was fun for me. So we had a good time. I thought I was going to be responsible for the demise of TK. <laughs> no, we'd have been all right. The universe was on our side. Yes, let's, let's jump right into this interview. I know you're only working on a few hours of sleep, so we, re we appreciate your time. Thank you so much. You grew up in Compton, correct? No, I grew up in Jersey City, New Jersey. <laughs> Okay. Um, I'm not really from Compton. I always tell people once I do the interview, I'm not from Compton. What happened in my career was I met a young man named Easy E. And um, Easy E um, gave me my first national um, stardom mm -hmm. on the Straight Outta Compton tour. So it, to pay homage to Easy, when I travel the country at the end of my shows, I always say TK Kirkham by way from Compton, California by way of Jersey City. Mm -hmm. And that's me paying homage to Easy e gotcha. for giving me my opportunity of a lifetime. Got you. Okay, um, and you ended up in the, the DOC video for Funky Enough. Yes, and, and, and during the 90s, I was in a little bit of everybody's um, videos, you know, from the DOC to NWA um, Express Yourself video yeah. um, to um, Second to None, AMG, Madonna. Um, Patty the Bell, The Whispers. I mean, the list is the list goes on. Like I've been, I was a work fool, especially back then. Yo. Yeah, we didn't. We don't have back then. We didn't have what they have now, social media that you can um, document everything. Right. And I was the kind of guy, believe it or not, um, I didn't really care. Mm. Like I would do TV shows, and my mom would be home watching TV. And call me like, babe, why you ain't tell me <laughs> that you was gonna be on this show? And I'm like, Ma, I got the check already, you know. <laughs> so, I don't look at entertainment the way most people get in this business. Mm -hmm. Look at entertainment. Um, my mindset is different. I'm, I'm a businessman. Comedy is my side hustle. <clears throat> what I understand about Hollywood and um, entertainment is that it's really not a great playing field for African Americans. Mm -hmm. I'm the kind of guy that um, I go where I'm celebrated, not tolerated, right? Mm -hmm. So doing shows, I make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But to go on auditions, you take a risk of someone liking you or casting you for a part. What I've done in my lifetime is if I, I have to produce my own thing, like how you have your setup, mm -hmm. you're in control of this, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, Netflix can give me a check. But I like the fact of knowing the date I'm going to shoot my special. Mm. I like the fact of knowing I know what my cover's going to look like mm -hmm. on my album cover or my, my, my poster. Mm -hmm. That's power to me. That's independence. Mm. Right? I see that Dave Chappelle's bringing on four comics to do um, his special, Dave Chappelle, Earthquake, and great opportunity for those comedians. I don't move like that. Mm. I can't work for another person. 
Okay. I have to be my own boss. And right. if there, and I'm I'm a millionaire. Mm -hmm. But if it means that I have to give up to become a multi, multi, multi man, I'm not doing it. Because what's in power to me is it's not about money to me. I'm already rich with spirit, energy, health. You know, I'm in my sixties and nobody believes it, right? Well preserved. So I'm 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 healthy and I'm happy, right? Yeah. So that's my um financial reward from the earth. Um, I feel that way in life. And like I always tell people that um, no matter how big the house gets, the bedroom's still going to be the same size. And no matter how many cars you get, you're going to drive one car at mm. a time. So um, I see the world differently. I move differently. I'm happy. My, my, I, I think that when your kids are doing good and you have to worry about your children, it's the blessing in the world. So I'm like, I'm truly, truly blessed, knock on wood. You talk a lot about women in your stand-up. Um, you talked about women with stank coochies. Right, right, right. Um, when was the last time you remember being in that situation where the coochie was overseas? It's been a long time, but what I do in life and relationships, I talk about everything from a woman's hygiene to men keeping his um, balls fresh, to his underwear game, things that really are not discussed and not make it funny. Mm -hmm. And I explain to women that a lot of y'all go to bed with men, but you never take the time to look at his T-shirt. And I said, ladies, if a man's T-shirt is loose around the chest area, he's had that on mm -hmm. for a few days. If his <laughs> underwear short is, like, look, really loose, like he's been playing basketball, if he had on the wilds, I said, ladies, and if any time a man get in bed with you and fuck you with socks, that's disrespectful. So the next time a man does that, ask him, can I see the bottom of your socks? You know, and if his socks is dirty, he cannot get in bed with you at all. So I talk about all that stuff. Yo, that's dope. And, and try to make it funny. I, 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 it's serious, but to make it funny, put a twist on it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask you this. Have you seen this new series about Hugh Hefner that's on A&E right now? No, but I heard that he had sex with an animal or something that they're saying. Yes, so one of his... Playmates slash girlfriend said that she walked in the room and saw him fornicating with a canine. Yeah. Wow. Now, there's a lot of other stories in there too, but that's just one of them. But here's the thing about life. I think it's so like An um, Prince Andrew, how they said he really liked animal sex. Um, Hugh Hefner. And all I can say is whatever you do behind closed doors. I think it's your personal business. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm real, um, I used to be threesomes and all that kind of stuff. And as I got older, I realized that in my bedroom, I just really wanted to be me and my young lady. It has to, I, I can't have that extra energy in my bedroom to offset me. Mm -hmm. I can't have nothing to set my energy off. But I also respect people, if that's their thing. Like, I'm not into the animals. Right. If that's your thing, like, you know, um, maybe you need help or, or something. But sometimes you can get so rich that you just do some crazy things. And that was the point that was brought up in this movie. But the, the, the thought that I had when I first saw it, because I've seen a, a ton of it, um, it's a lot of stories about you know abuse and blackmail and things like that. And I thought, well, it's called... Uh, Secrets of Playboy, and then I thought, I put this on Twitter, maybe it should have been called Surviving Hugh Hefner, because mm -hmm. that's what we said with our R. Kelly situation, right? right? right. And with the with the Bill Cosby situation, which mm -hmm. I know is, is part of your act as well, you right. see that double standard that play a little bit? Yeah, 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 and it's just the way of the world because we don't control the narrative. Mm -hmm. See, and when you can't control it, there's nothing you could do. It's just, it's just like um, when um, DMX died, they, and the Prince of England died, well, they put the Prince of England in a suit, but had DMX in a, a, a necklace looking like a street hoodlum on Daily News. Mm -hmm. And it was so much complaints that they switched it and made sure they put a proper right. picture of DMX on the um, cover. But when you, can't, when you don't control the narratives, your, your hands are pretty much tied. That's why we have to speak up and teach the world on ourselves the, the, the real truth. And that's the great thing about what has happened over the last 20 years, social media, mm. Google, like nothing can be hid anymore. Mm -hmm. you, the, the information is at the tip of your finger. Yeah. And anything you want to know, you can find out. And you brought that up in, in the show last night where you talked about uh, the young people don't grasp the appreciation of how powerful the social media is because yes. from where we, can you expound on right. that? Right, well, like, you know, like Cash App, we had Western Union when we were young. Mm -hmm. um, 
Um, you got GPS, where back in our day, our parents had to pull out a map, put it on the hood of the car, mm -hmm. and everybody looked over there like they really knew where they was going, <laughs> and nothing. you end up lost, right? <laughs> right? So I try to make people where even from the rotary phone mm. to now you could see somebody clear on the other side of the world, mm -hmm. and it all started from this rotary phone type thing, and I make it funny by... Um, if your parents ever poked you in the chest, mm. it's because of the workout they had dialing with a rotary phone. I said, because the dial eight and take that thing all the way around, <laughs> that strengthened that finger up for years. <laughs> and to, it also taught you patience because you really had to wait damn near five seconds for that eight to come all the way back around. It's hilarious. Well, then also, what if you, what if you dial the wrong number? Right. See, back then you really didn't dial the wrong number that much because you really <laughs> right. You, yeah, had to, you, you really had right. to go in there. You had to look at it. And I'm going to talk about that tonight about um, when we were younger before mobile phones, we were smarter. Mm. Everybody, in, everybody in this room knew about 20, 30, 40 numbers uh, off the top of your head. Yes. Can nobody know one motherfucking phone number? I don't number know. Now? I might not know mine. Exactly. Right? You don't know no cell phone number now. Right. You know, when I used to get locked up, you know, I know numbers on the top of my head. But when I was getting locked up in the early 2000s, mm -hmm. I used to tell you, yo, let me get a pen. And, and you get the phone and you write the numbers down and their names in, on a piece of paper. Yeah. And that paper has to last you until you go to court. Because by sleeping, putting the envelope and everything, it starts crinkling. And then one number on the end could be off. Well, you know, I met this uh, <laughs> the young lady, and you met her yesterday. Um, when I first met her, she came to the office I was working at. And long story short, she, she was going to give me her number. Right. And so when she was about to give me her number, I had a post-it note right here in the pen. And I but she's young, she's right. under 30. Right. So I said, here, um, let me write down. And I said, oh, I might have blew it. Because... The young people don't do that no. They go right to the phone and start plugging it no, in. No, as long as you don't give it away. Yeah. Oh, see, I, right, right. See, don't say. I did give it away. Yeah. See, don't say that is a problem. <laughs> I'm giving you game, right? Don't say it's a problem. Say, yo, you know what? Let me write this down because I yeah. don't want to lose this number. It's how you say it, right? I'm a player, y'all. Yeah. So I'm just letting everybody. Know. No, let's get it twisted. I'm certified yeah. too, yeah. but I still get gems. Yeah. You no, know, yeah. you guys. Let me. Let me. I want to make sure I don't lose this number. Yeah. Write the number down. Bam. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. how you do it. Um, and you mentioned being um, locked up a few times. I, I think I've seen somewhere that you mentioned you were locked up with Tupac. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I want to talk about that tonight, too. That's crazy. Back in the 90s, mm -hmm. when I had gotten in trouble, um, they put celebrities in protective custody. Not that you were scared to be in general population. The, the, um, the CEOs that... Uh, jail, mm -hmm. they know who you are. Mm -hmm. You automatically going into protective custody. Mm -hmm. So um, when I was locked up and had protective custody, it was Rick James, Tupac, the Menendez brothers, oh, man. and T.K. Kirkland. Eric and Kyle Menendez. We, talk. we was in there. <laughs> and what was so crazy, people knew I was in there. And they was like, yo, TK, tell us a joke, but I'm fighting a case in my head. Like, I'm dealing with attorneys and everything. And I said, nah, man, fuck that. They said, nigga, you ain't gonna tell us a motherfucking joke. The whole jail. I said, nah, fuck y'all. Them motherfuckers booed me. That's the only time I've been booed <laughs> in jail. Them motherfuckers, I'm talking about about 200 people, <laughs> booed the fuck out of me. And I did this joke about, is this the bus to go to school? And they laughed so hard. Is really one of the greatest performances in my fucking career. Wow. Because they laughed like I was at Madison Square Garden. Like it was, a, and now when I think about it, it sends chills to my body because it was an awesome, awesome, awesome night that day. Mm -hmm. Because it went from booze. Mm -hmm. Like they bogarded me in to tell them the joke. <laughs> like, you know, so I was like, fuck it. And I just told it. Mm -hmm. And they laughed so hard because, like, you know, when you're everybody's under. Tremendous pressure. You don't have no alcohol. You don't have nothing. It's just us. Mm -hmm. But the way I said the joke, the way I put the energy in it, it's insane. And then, and you said Rick James was there, but then, but did you talk to Tupac? Or were you just in the same jail as him at the time? Yeah, um, Tupac and all of us knew each other. We oh. even knew. Um, believe it or not, Tupac is the one that gave me the um, the name T to the motherfucking K. Word. Yeah. So. Um, 
It's, it's just amazing. I, I have so many stories that the shit is just insane. Mm -hmm. You know, we just do Jack the Rapper mm -hmm. together yeah. back in the day. Yeah. You know, Jack the Rapper. Um, Suge Knight used to be my bodyguard. Suge Knight was your bodyguard. Yeah, being the DLC. Because we was all, me and DLC was roommates and we was on bus mates. So Suge um, protected me and um, the DLC. And so, what was Suge Knight at that time? Did he? Have he was a, um, just a bodyguard. He was at UNLV at the um, at the University of yes. Univers Los the University of Las Vegas, and then his career just took off. You know, it's a shame what happened right. because when you see Dr. Dre and him at the Super Bowl, and you see what could have been mm. if whatever was going through his mind, mm -hmm. whatever demons he was dealing with, if he had just um, took approach of just being. It's an average man mm -hmm. that wanted to do the right thing. But you, it goes to show you from Donald Trump to um, 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 Suge to people getting power, it, um, it can change you. Mm -hmm. And if you don't handle it the right way, it can, it can really mess you up. You like sort of like the um, Forrest Gump of entertainment. Because you go through so many eras, yes, so many different artists, different genres of artists and yes. stuff like that. You you paid Jay Z fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah, Jay Z did my birthday party when he first started. Um, I threw a beautiful party up in Harlem, and I was more famous than Jay Z at the time. Mm -hmm. So you know we got the nice cars outside, we got the mink coats, and him and Damon Dash was late. Mm. And um, ego party was nice, beautiful women. And they was late. I said, "Fuck them niggas." Got got my back to them, yeah. really disrespecting them in no. a sense. And my boy was like, "Yo, you gotta let them on TK, you know." So he went on there, and that motherfucker turned to the house. I pulled him to the side like a gangster, you know. Mm -hmm. Pulled out fifteen hundred dollars, you know, like you know. And as I'm talking, I slide it to him, you know. Yeah. It was like, "Thank you, brother," yeah. you know. And I tell people all to this day, I said that was. Seed money that made him a billionaire, because he took that fifty gun, you flipped it, flipped it, flipped it, flipped it, and became a billionaire. So oh, shout out to Jay Z. My man, take he need his cut. TK need his cut. Yeah, yeah. no, 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 no. That's a good. That's a good. I'm glad he's doing his thing. You know. Oh, you talking about being locked up? What kind of advice? Because you you dropped so many gems for brothers coming home. What's some advice you can give? Man, coming home, you just got to hope that you come home to the right situation. Mm -hmm. And you got the right, when I mean right situation, what kind of probation officer you have. Mm -hmm. Are you financially prepared to um, get your own place? Or you got to live with somebody you don't like and they're being horrible on you. They're not treating you or helping you right. get on your right feet. Um, then you have some probation systems that you can't leave certain states. Let's say you go out of state. And you get in trouble. Mm -hmm. But when you get out, you got to stay in that state. Mm -hmm. You can't go home. So you might have to live in a shelter yeah. and go to work from a shelter, from the shelter, go to work and come back. Um, and sometimes they keep you five years, yo. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can't go home. Yeah. And if you cross that line, I remember one time I was locked up. Wow. I had got out, or I had just came in. The young man had went out. He was back in jail two days later mm. because of, of a misunderstanding. Something happened at a bus stop, and they locked him. He was crying so bad. He got locked back up, and they put him back in. So just so many horrible stories out here. And um, I always tell them, black or white, um, or Spanish, or Latin, or Asian, do your best not to get in trouble because once you go in, it's hard to get out. Mm -hmm. It really is. And you really just got to... Um, have your blessing. I, I, I stay out the way. And then you take time throughout your act to, um, at least the act I saw last night, you spoke a lot to the young people, yes. to, to, to younger people. And you talked about um, them being not sophisticated in the hustle. And you specifically spoke uh, about that in relation to the PPP loan situation. Yeah, so because you... um, I came up a hustler. I was a smart guy. I went to, went to college. And I really was playing all the fields. I was, I guess the universe was teaching me to learn all these things. Mm -hmm. So at my age now, I could give advice on so many different things because I, you don't know what you're going through at the time. And then you also have to know your purpose on earth, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know their purpose. Mm -hmm. So I know my purpose, so it gives me an advantage over most people in life. So when I explain to people about hustling, I'm taking hustling and, and making people understand their their universe, their, their area, right? Because um, if you're going through life and you don't know how to make money, if you're going through life and 
um, you're not paying attention, you're not reading, you're not um, uh, uh, educating yourself, mm -hmm. then how can you win? Right. Because believe it or not, there's so many grants in this country that people don't know about that can get you money. There's so many things that you do legitimately that can keep you on the right track to success. Mm -hmm. And the PPP loan, the SBA loan was one of them because it was high profile. But most people was falling back on because they was like, oh, that's a scam or whatever because they couldn't believe it was getting that kind of money. But the government's pulling the biggest scam of them all because they gave out all that money. They had so many rules, but in actuality, they always knew they never, you was never going to pay it back because they were stealing, right? They mm -hmm. were stealing. They was telling their homies uh, on, the, on the golf course, I'm about to give you $400 million. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And um, they're like, what? Like, we can't talk about it on the phone. I'll talk to you on the golf course. And at the end, they forgave $1.9 trillion. And I tell people all the time, you didn't have an LLC, an a EIN before March of 2019. That's all you had to have mm -hmm. was an LLC and an EIN before March 19th mm -hmm. of 2019. You could have got a little check, mm -hmm. you know. And what people are always thinking, it could have been millions, but I don't give a fuck. I'm giving 20, 30, 40,000. If you can get that from the government and not pay it back, you winning. Mm -hmm. So now you look at fast forward, you see what Biden has did for the um, people with student loans. Mm -hmm. He forgave over a, a billion something, a four something billion, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, the numbers are right, about um, student loans that you don't have to pay back. And that takes a lot of pressure because a lot of um, rich families are, don't have that on their back when they graduate from mm -hmm. college, right? Mm -hmm. They'll go to college, kids go to college, but they're in debt till they're 40, 50 years old to pay back a student loan. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's hard. When some you're trying to make it and someone takes this seven, eight, nine, fourteen hundred, maybe three thousand dollars out of your check. Yeah. And now that's gone, it puts people who are handicapped into a great situation. So that's a great thing Biden did. And you said that they um that some of these young people was uh kind of hustling backwards because you said the whole they was going to give you this money for free, but then the people decided to go try to get millions and millions of dollars. Yes, in the, in the PPP loan. And what they did was they was buying Rolls Royces, Rolex, dumb shit mm -hmm. that it, it shows that you're not used to anything. And when you go purchase big things like that, you're, a red flag pops up by your name, now the government is on you. And if they see, they check, you know, they, they check other files and they see that you got a PPP loan, they say that you're abusing the money. And it's not worth it. Some of these people's only driving the car for two weeks. But they're about to do 10 to 15 years. Yo. It's crazy how the mindset of people um, uh, um, will do a PPP loan, do crime, to become a rapper mm. and now get a criminal record. He was a nice kid until he became a rapper. Mm. Now you're drinking lean, your body looking fucked up, mm. you look like you're about to die. You know, you look older than what you're really supposed to look. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's just sad the way. Um, young people are thinking today. Um, what do you think about this, uh, all the stuff that we've seen surrounding uh, a guy like Kanye West recently? Well, Kanye will say that he doesn't think he has a mental problem. But again, money um, didn't help his situation. Um, we're not therapists, so we don't really know what happened. But if I'm a man talking to another man, if I saw him, I would say that you move it incorrectly because a lot of people look up to you. Mm -hmm. And even though I don't consider you a leader, um, social media has made you a leader of the African-American community. Mm -hmm. And you're moving recklessly. You know, um, you had an ex-wife. And, and be a man and accept that you're not together no more. Don't be putting all your business on social media. Don't right. be trying to embarrass yourself. Don't be on like, well, I don't know where my daughter's birthday party. Like a bitch, mm -hmm. right? And the thing about it, if you're a man, you got the money. Well, if she gave a party with her and the new guy she fucking with, applaud. Mm -hmm. Nigga, you can throw your own motherfucking party. <laughs> you got the money, nigga, you can rent out Disneyland if you want to. Yeah. So, it, believe it or not, you're giving two parties. Let, let her do her thing, you do your thing, but you got to be a man. And most men can't let things go. They want to have a female behavior, um, behavior to um, act this way, but the world is watching. 
Mm -hmm. And I like for men to move like men. Like, if, nigga, you know, I, I, I could stand being a love pussy good or whatever. You know, the way you live. But he was in the house with Kim. Mm -hmm. you know, he had to do the right thing. He had, you divorced her. Mm -hmm. And then you act in this way. And, it, and the people who are looking is watching. Mm -hmm. and, you, and, and believe it or not, you're programming these young guys who, with domestic violence, is getting high. You, young men is killing girls and killing the babies, kill, sometimes killing the grandmother and the mom because of the emotional rise in this country that um, is men like Kanye helps provoke. Because if we have more men who dress like men, you got a Russell Westbrook dressing like a bitch, you got yeah, motherfucking baffle players walking the hallways with bags, like female bags <laughs> yeah. and shit, you know? And the NBA to me should program in sports should make men wear certain things. Like your, your personal life, your personal life, but when you're on that camera, you got to move a certain way. Yeah. And um, they stopped Allen Iverson when he was wearing the mink coats and, and the, the jewelry. jewelry. And, you know, they stopped that. Mm -hmm. And I really think uh, uh, it should be a rule. Mm -hmm. Suit and tie mm -hmm. as you walk through that f fucking corridor. Now, you got a club and doing whatever the fuck you want. Right. But when you represent the NBA, you represent the NFL, you got to be prestigious, you got to look good, and we want to send a message to young men and women mm -hmm. to represent yourselves very well. That's my opinion on that. Absolutely. And uh, you did Comic View back in the day. Yes. Um, that's history. So mm -hmm. take us behind the scenes. Was BET spending money on that show? Um, did y'all know then that the show would have such an enduring and long-lasting impact on black culture? Well, here's the thing about BET. I don't like um, anything ran where it's not done well. Mm -hmm. And back then, even then, that's the reason why I never really did TV or film. Mm -hmm. I know how I'm supposed to be treated. And Comic Group was cool, but I really didn't like going there because it was ran the way I would run things. It was ran unprofessionally. It was ran um, to a point that I was irritated mm -hmm. in doing those shows. So I did them and boom, do my thing and I, I, I go my opposite direction. But... Um, BET was cool, it helps with your resume, mm -hmm. but the shows that changed my life, and I knew it years ago, it was going to be the young kids that was going to admire me. And I knew in my, in my 30s and 40s that the people who was going to help me get successful was in their 20s. Mm -hmm. So here we fast forward, and then you got a young man named Vlad, mm -hmm. um, Vlad TV, who um, puts me on the show three times a year, who pretty much changed my career mm -hmm. overnight, right? You got... Um, um, Charlemagne the God, Angela Yee, and DJ Envy mm -hmm. from The Breakfast Club, who um, um, brings me in the show. But it's also my knowledge and wisdom that I have that makes my shows go viral. You so bring I, invi you bring in value. I bring value. Because you know, today, if you're not saying anything worthy, if your numbers are not big, nobody wants to fuck with you, which I think is bad. Mm -hmm. But thank God I have the numbers to, um, to get me on those shows. So um, those shows changed my life, things of the, your, your show. And it's good that people know that I exist. They see the stand-up. Because I truly feel I'm the best stand-up comedian ever. And mm -hmm. the reason why I say that is because when you come to a different show, you can come see me the same weekend, see me six times, it's going to be a different show. But you laugh from beginning to end. Like some comedians got a good 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah. Then it goes downhill. My show, you laugh from beginning to end. If I'm on stage an hour and 30 minutes, you're going to laugh for an hour and 30 minutes. Straight. And you don't write jokes. No, 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 no. I don't write jokes. I go with um, what's in my heart. Like tonight, I will talk about the Menendez brothers and Tupac because I really forgot about that, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll bring that in my, um, my stand-up tonight and um, mm -hmm. see where it goes. I don't, I don't push like a ball player. Mm -hmm. You got to let stuff come to you organically. Mm -hmm. So I let my show come to me organically. I don't force it. You really have a conversation with the audience the entire time. Yeah. I mean, it, it, there's some jokes in there, but still in the form of a conversation. Right, right, last right. Last night what I saw was a two-hour conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was only for a long time. So um, I'm just glad the shows are selling out, you know, because at the end of the day, my favorite days of the week is Monday because I get to check on Sunday, mm -hmm. and I'm at the bank at 9.10 <laughs> on Monday, but then I'm broke at 9.15, so you can't catch me between 9.10 and 15. <laughs> like, if, once I put that money in the bank, I'm broke. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm struggling. <laughs> <laughs> and you really had a conversation with this lady at the, almost at the end of the show last night. Um, 
I, y'all was going back and forth. It seemed like the whole show, but you ended up. You asked her. Did she worked for Recovery? You asked her what she used to be on because she used to be on something. Yeah, 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 she yeah. Said the young she lady. She was on crack, and then you said to her like, "Yeah, I could tell. Like, you, you look. You said you look like you was fine back in the day." Yeah. So yeah, you look fucked up now. I said you're not gonna recover. You know what I'm saying? Like basically, you still look fucked up, but you got it together. You know, and, and she accepted it. You know, I was just telling the truth, and the way I get myself out, I said, "Don't get mad at me. The Lord told me to tell you that." <laughs> You know, so I said, I'm only talking because the Lord sent me. Uh, I was, I want to ask you who you look up to on comedy, but I think we had a little bit of this conversation yesterday. Do you don't really follow comics? No, 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 no. I don't follow stand up um, like that. Like, you know, some comedians, there's, there's, a, there's true comedians out there. Mm -hmm. True comedians. True comedians are the people who, who laugh all the time, know the history of different stand up comedians. I'm not like that. I'm truly one of those guys who fell into a great situation mm. and took advantage of it. Mm. But if anybody was telling me I was this is the route I was going, I wasn't going the route of stand up comedy. Um as of now I don't know what I would have done back then, but I know it wasn't stand up. And when I saw that stand up was good, it was good therapy. It keeps me in shape because I work out compared to getting ready for a a ball game like a football player. Right. Or a basketball player. So I stay in the gym. I take care of myself so that I can be on stage and give a great show. Um, I saw in, in an interview uh, that you were, you were going to try to get on Joe Ro Rogan's show. Yes. Um, what do you think you will say to him when you get there as it relates to his use of the N-word? Um, I wouldn't say nothing because I say nigga. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, like I said, I move differently than everybody else. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that's, I don't even think I will even bring it up. Mm -hmm. I, don't even, I, I, I just move like that. We all have our crisis in life. We mm -hmm. all been through something. And I think when a man goes through anything, the best thing to do is, um, if you know that person, you say, um, are you okay? But if I don't know you, I'm not going to bring it up. Just like from the situation with Whoopi Goldberg, the situation with um, mm -hmm. Vlad when they were talking about religion. Mm -hmm. People can avoid that if they understand the rules of life, right? Mm -hmm. the, one of the rules of life is, and it's been taught to us since we were children, never discuss politics and religion. Mm -hmm. It's a rule you have to live by. Mm -hmm. And if you live by it, you'll never get in a bad situation. So Whoopi would remind herself about that rule. Don't discuss politics and religion. No matter if it comes up at your table, somebody got to be strong enough to say, I don't, I don't discuss politics and religion. But that's what that show, The View, is about, though. But you still got to stand on your principles. Mm -hmm. See, because um, Whoopi Goldberg could have got fired. Like that. See, if he, he could have got fired. You don't get no second chances. Mm -hmm. So it's just best to be safe. I believe in CYA cover your ass. Right. You know, so um, don't discuss politics. Every day. <laughs> Speaking of politics, what do you think about, I'm just playing. Mm -hmm. you've, been, <laughs> you, you, you've been a successful comic for a long time. You ever had a, a regular nine to five ever? Um, probably when I was in um, college, I worked a little something just to throw the feds off and the, the people, you know, had to have a little part time job. And I wanted to see what it felt like. Too. And believe it or not, when I was um, locked up, um, during my community service, I had a couple of jobs because they had me going different places. I was uh, working with the sewer company, mm -hmm. getting the, the, the sewer stuff out of the, um, out of the streets. Mm -hmm. I worked in the, um, when they do re recycle water to go back, you know, in, mm -hmm. into your house. And mm -hmm. the, I did that. And I'm going to bring that up tonight, too. It's just so funny because um, before Uber Eats, when I was working on the um, in the parks, mm -hmm. and they take us to different places, I on lunch break I would call pizza places and delivery services. If you worked already like this crew, mm -hmm. I would have food delivered to us at the park. Mm -hmm. We in jail, we in jail now. We do community service, pizzas, the sandwiches. Everybody loved fucking with me. Like three Spanish guys, I put them through college. Cause I enjoyed them so well. Wow! Yeah, um, they, I, I sent them to Devry. I forgot their names. If they ever see this interview, make sure you hit me. Like I just really enjoyed them, and I paid their way through school. Yeah. Yeah, sure did. That's that's dope. Yeah, I paid um, their way through school. Um, what's the most obvious thing a woman can do to cancel herself in your book? Profanity. Around you? Yeah, okay. around me. I don't like profanity. Okay. I think I talk about that in stage. So I think a woman should always be a lady. Mm -hmm. And what women don't understand, to me, is that a, a man wants a woman who is soft mm, and gentle. Right. Like, if you 
talking and you sound like a dude, you aggressive. I'm being like, I mean, you still can be mad, right. but sound like a lady. If you saying words like fuck you and you like you bulking up like a man, yeah. you know, or you frown, you got the little tension in your face like a man. Men want women who, no matter what the situation, you look like a lady, you mm -hmm. soft. You, and I think that means a lot to a man, you know? So that's one of the things, profanity will get you X'd out. And I always try to, I try to get men to look at a woman's accomplishments. Mm. See, men just look at ass or find a woman attractive, and they go for that, mm -hmm. you know? But it's really everything. Mm. You know, what have you accomplished in your life? You know, what are you doing? What, 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 what are your intentions with the rest of your life? And believe it or not, what's your health? Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't check out a person's health. The bitch died two or three years. The man died two or three years. You know, no one takes the time to see the person that you fall in love with is healthy mm. because it's an investment. You know, me and you, was, if I was your advisor in stock and we were sitting down looking at the profile I, and I saw that the numbers were doing bad, I would say, hey, we, we're not going to buy this. We'll look at something else. The same thing with a female. Man, you got to see what they're bringing to the table. And if it's a good thing, then you invest and you dive in for the long term, you know, but people, most people think with their heart yeah, and not with their mind. What and that it? gets you fucked up every time. What was, what's the, what do you think is one of the biggest mistakes that you've ever made when it came to a woman? Um, not pulling out. <laughs> my pullout game was fucking horrible. No, my pull out game is fucking hard. Hey, horrible. look at the crew back here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I got seven kids, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So my, pull, no, my kids are all successful, though, because they, they definitely take after my side of the family. Yeah. It's the DNA. But um, I wish I would have pulled out because I'm, I'm a great dad. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I mean I would have pulled out because I spread myself thin. Mm -hmm. I, I give everybody ample time in the different parts of the country. Mm -hmm. Everybody's in college, mm -hmm. everybody needs guidance. So, and sometimes I just want peace, and then I don't have the peace, right? But then with the way the world is, you worry about if your kids are healthy. Mm. You worry about, you don't want nothing to happen to them. Yeah. You give them guidance, and, you know, I'm setting up things with trucking companies for all my kids to have their own truck and to build from that. Um, all my kids got to have an LLC and an EIN. Um, all these things take time and progress. You know, you got to put your kids on your American Express card. When they're young, so they get a certain age, they have good credit. Mm. So all these things is a process that my mind constantly thinks about. Mm. And then, you know, you, you want to fuck every now and then. You know, you, you know, I like women. So, you know, um, you want to have sex, but then you have the time. Mm. And then when you're successful, like, you know, being blessed like I am, thank God, um, you want to kick it. Mm. But by the time you say good night, it's time to go to bed. Mm -hmm. Five o'clock, I got to catch another flight. Mm. Damn, bitch, I think you're fine, but guess what? I'm in another state tomorrow, so this is impossible. Mm. And then you like that girl that day. Mm. Then you get in another state, you see, you meet somebody prettier, fatter ass, and more beautiful than that person. So, nigga, yeah, this is a non stop. So, you gotta, um, some people say, well, you, you can't have everybody. But I'm sure if I could try. <laughs> I know you, you're known as a player. Have you ever had any stalkers or fatal attraction type women in your life? No, 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 no. You know, I have people who, they, they, people really respect me, which is cool. Um, and nobody really crosses the line. So I, I, I'm blessed in that area. I'm going to say uh, a name and then you give me one word that mm -hmm. comes to mind. Steve Harvey. Um, no comment. Okay, Lizzo. Uh, no comment. Kodak Black. Talented motherfucker. Kodak uh, Black is talented. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I, I don't, um, as a man, something strange, but when that motherfucker sing, I'm a fan. Like, he, he, I use his music right now as my intro to go on stage. Is that what you played last night? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, Grim, um, Gremlin. Mm -hmm. The nigga talented, yo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He, he a fool, <laughs> but he talented. Uh, Nick Cannon. Um, nice young man, slinging dick, and thank God he got money to take care of the kids that he's in. I, I mean, I've known him since he got started, um, and I know for a fact if it wasn't for the money, he couldn't fuck none of the women that he fucking with. And I always say that men who got game, um, money just enhances you, but it, it, if it's in your DNA, it's in your DNA. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean go to a woman broke. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, still have your shit together. Mm -hmm. But and 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 and, and some men are say a woman is a gold digger, but um, women want successful men too. You know, you a man want a woman with beauty, and a woman wants something with such as me. Mm -hmm. I think it should be both. I think a man should have shit together, and he should date a woman who's beautiful. Mm -hmm. But baby, you gotta have you gotta have something. How about Ice Cube? Oh my man, you know, he, he, he look like his career. You know, he, he's had no infidelity issues. He's not in the news for no dumb shit. Mm -hmm. He doesn't embarrass his mother and father. Just he's all the way solid. Jada Pinkett Smith. Um, they should take that show away from her. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think Jada Pinkett um, talks just to be talking, and that's pretty much I gotta say because I know Will Smith. So out of respect, the kind of man that I am, I can't badmouth the man's wife the way I really would like to because I just move a certain way. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't like the way she moves on that show. So and or the way she embarrasses him. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so let's just try one or the other. This is hypothetical mm -hmm. stuff. Taraji P. Henson or Kerry Washington? None of them. <laughs> mm -mm. Dr. J. or Magic Johnson? Dr. J. Okay. All right. Shaq or Kareem? It's a good question. Kareem. Kareem got how many rings? He has a lot, but like Kareem just to me, since I'm old school, it just moves a certain way. Mm. And he doesn't get the credit mm. that he should as one of the greatest basketball players that ever lived. Mm -hmm. And that's what social media has done, is taken away the people who really should get the fame. Like everybody say Michael Jordan, but nobody talks about Bill Russell, mm -hmm. who has 11 rings, mm -hmm. right? No one discusses that. No one talks about Kareem, mm -hmm. who was really the man with the sky hook. Like, he was unbelievable. I watched him win a championship with that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he played for Milwaukee Bucks. Yeah. I remember sitting at the TV. They passed him the ball. He took three steps and did that sky hook and won the goddamn And man. we was doing that in the playground. Like, you won't see kids doing sky hooks in the playground. Nah, you don't see But that. we was emulating Kareem in the 80s yes. with the sky hook. Yes. You know, so Kareem, wow. I wish people could have came up during that era. And we've got to start understanding that um, comparing people to other people, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. LeBron is good for his era. Mm -hmm. Michael Jordan was good for his era. Yeah. Kareem was good for his era. Mm -hmm. Dr. Dre, Dr. J was good for his era. But every day on the news and sports, they always bring up Michael Jordan and LeBron. And it goes to show you that um, the lack of knowledge and creativity is has fallen. Nobody knows how to take it to another level. And Kareem was, for a long time, I believe, the all-time leading scorer for the NBA. Yes. And I think just the other day, LeBron eclipsed that, if yes. I'm not mistaken. Something, yeah, but look how long it took. Right. Right? Look how long it took. And he they, came and, in the league and, in 03. Yeah, and Kareem should really get more props. And then yeah. you got Will Chamberlain, who scored the 100 points. Like, yeah. that, like he, was a, he was the man. You know, I saw an interview, I think it was on Dick Cavett or... Um, um, David Letterman, and he said, how, could, how would he play up against um, Shaquille O'Neal? And Will Chamberlain said, yeah, well, you know, he told the Buckles how he talked about how he benched 600-something um, pounds. And um, he said that he would play Shaquille totally different. And I didn't know um, what was really that dominant. Will Chamberlain was, was unbelievable, yeah. though. So it, it, it goes to show you, I was talking about the other day about the Magic Johnson, Larry Bird's compared to the young players today, you know, there's people on the bench that made more, make more money than Kareem, oh, Magic, man. and Bird combined That's crazy. what they made in their career. That's crazy. And then the, the, one of the coldest hustles ever is a lot of people don't know um, Michael Jordan's Nike contract. Hmm. I don't know who did this deal, but I, I had, I, like, I'm a great negotiator. I, I think I'm Ari Gold from uh, uh, um, <laughs> Entourage. Entourage. <laughs> and you know Michael Jordan only gets 5% of every sale? Did you say he only gets 5%? 5%. But it, it's equivalent to $150 million a year. That's easy to say, but there's no way I'd have did a deal. Me. I'm just <laughs> right. telling you how I move. <laughs> right. There's no fucking way. All these years, you're just going to give me 5%. Because how many B's is that you could have had? That's like... I, I, the worst case scenario... 
I did 20. 20 percent? 20 percent. Because the way I negotiated the deal, that yeah, y'all make the company, but you can't sell. I'm the artist, right? You're, Nike's the promoter. I'm the artist. Mm -hmm. You can't get asses in the seats unless you put me and sell my name, right? Mm -hmm. So since I'm the artist, I want 20%. Because we buying the shoes is like filling seats up in the arena. Right. I, there's no fucking way I did a Nike deal for 5%. What was the first nice big check you got? Um, hustling in the street, about 820000 I, you know, I, I was rich and I was 21 years old. So, you know, some people took a lifetime. Right? You know, I, I've always been getting money my whole life. Mm. So, like I said, it's not really about the money to me. What, what, what I like about being in my 60s is um, sitting in my home with my robe on, going outside with my leaf blowing and blowing the leaves, mm. or sipping on coffee, or walking to the mailbox and getting a check for something I did 10, 15 years ago, mm. or creating a catalog. I was trying to sign other comedians to my label, and a lot of com comics don't understand catalog. Mm -hmm. You know, um, their agents probably tell them about catalog, but a comedian of his own, they, they don't get it. So I was trying to get, without saying people's names, I was trying to teach them about catalog. So I get money from stuff I did years ago because I created a catalog, mm. and those things are important to me. Um, my shows, my production company, I do my own stand-up comedy specials. Um, I make a lot of money off it. I put it on YouTube. I mean, not YouTube. I put it on um, Amazon Prime for a certain amount of time. Then I put it on Tubi. And every year, over the last six, seven years, I've been in business 30-something years, my star has risen even more. So every, every day I wake up, I'm more famous, more popular than I was the day before. I don't know if this, if this was just a joke or not, but you said... I saw this on a headline, too, on a video. You said that if you were married, you could be faithful or pay the bills, but not both. It was just a That's joke. just a joke? It was just a joke. Okay. Um, I was playing, I said, I'm, I'm not going to do both. Mm -hmm. But marriage is a, very, is a very serious thing to do. That's why I'm not married. I'll tell a female in a minute, um, do you want to be with me forever, or you just want to be married for two or three years? Because I have a strategy in how a person should live. Mm -hmm. I don't think people should be under one roof all the time together. Mm. I believe that if I meet you and you got your life together already, well, guess what? I want you to stay in your house. I stay in my house, but I'm going to be faithful. You come see me, I come see you. Because I want my fucking space and time. I'm going to talk all damn day. I want to, if um, you have a bad day and I have a good day, I don't want you to come home and fuck up my day. Mm. You know, because if you're going on a date or you get ready to go out and your wife says, oh, my God, I had a bad day. I'm like, oh, now your day fucked up. Well, I'm like, bitch, I'm happy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, right. fuck that. I'm, I still want to do what I had planned. Right. So, and I don't deal with pettiness. A lot of women are petty. Mm. You know, they create problems that don't fucking exist. Now you find out you're buying flowers and trying to make them happy for something you have no fucking idea <laughs> what happened. I don't do that shit, yo. Not me. I don't got time for it. Um, you were in a movie with Vin Diesel, right? Yes, called Strays. Called Strays. Uh, what's Vin Diesel like in real life? Vin Diesel back then, I'm, I'm quite sure he's changed a lot because people change and get money. But when I met him, Vin Diesel was a nice guy. Um, I saw his whole life change. We went to um, Park City, Utah for the um, film festival. Um, Steven Spielberg was there. Uh, and believe it or not, I was the funniest fucking thing in Strays. Mm. But I didn't have an agent or anything to push that, my, push my situation in that movie. So um, Steven Spielberg saw him. The rest is history, and now um, Vin Diesel's doing um, Fast and the Furious 900. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. He's also very well preserved. I don't know how old Vin Diesel is, but I'm No, Vin Diesel's aging now. Is he? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He, he, look, he, he look his age now. He look every bit yeah, of he look, yeah, yep, he look old, that <laughs> motherfucker. Yes, he do. Shout um, out to Vin. <laughs> shout out to Vin Diesel. Uh, I saw that you tore a heckler up at Caroline's Comedy Club. Um, have you ever had a dude... Waiting for you outside after a show? No, nah, most people are afraid of me, but I'm also afraid too mm. because of, of my past. Mm. See, I've been to court. I've been in jail. I, I know how it is to lose something. And if you do have to have a fight in today's world, you don't know if you're going to die or you're going to hurt somebody. And is it really worth it to lose everything you worked hard for? Mm. 
So I'm nervous. I'm scared because I don't want to lose my house. I don't want to lose the little change I worked hard for. I don't want to be away from my children, mm -hmm. right? So I try to avoid those things. So when you're on the mic, you are really, you control the outcome of everything. So my goal at the end of the day is make things peaceful. With comedy, um, what was the moment that you thought, yeah, I made it, this could actually be my career? Um, you, I don't never think that way. Okay. I believe every day I got to prove myself. Okay. You know, um, yesterday was yesterday. It's like a ball player. If, you, if you're a real athlete, you don't, um, you know you're good, but you still want to prove yourself every day. Mm -hmm. You know, and you still have to have the confidence to know that you're good. I think one of the greatest things in sports to me that motivates me is um, Joe Montana in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. They was losing. I don't know if it was against Dallas or the Bengals or somebody. It was in San Francisco, and they was coming down the field. Mm -hmm. And um, Joe said in the huddle, "Hey, everybody, did you see John Candy in the in the stands? You know, this is championship of this fucking world." And, and Joe was <laughs> talking about motherfuckers in the stands, <laughs> and went down and scored a touchdown. And that's the way I look at life. Some people look short short-sighted, mm -hmm. but if we was in a stadium, all of us right now in a stadium, I see the whole stadium. Just like when I'm on stage, I see everything on, st I see everything in the room. Mm -hmm. So when you're a great athlete, you have to see everything in the stadium. Mm -hmm. You know where the security guard is up on, at the top, you see a person just leaving, going to the concession stand. You see the band member walking through the table. You see a car with a trolley going by. You see a couple of women, cheerleaders, walking by. You see everything moving. It's like the Matrix. You see everything. That's a great football player. Mm -hmm. Well, as a stand-up comedian, when I'm on stage out of my peripheral, back door, see people coming in, I see everything. And that's the same way I approach life. Yeah. I see I'm down. Some people only think about tomorrow. I am already on the year 2030, 2031. That's how far advanced I think. Wow. And I know you see everything. Like well, last night at the show, my girl said, I got to go to the bathroom. I said, well, don't move because he might see you and say something. Mm -hmm. But after like 15 seconds, I'll just, you go ahead, go to the bathroom right. and just pray. Because I, I, I don't know how you get down. No, but normally if I see you, if people are doing it too much, mm -hmm. I'll say, excuse me, can you come back for a minute, please? Mm -hmm. And he's like, no, I got to go. Listen, just for a minute. Because I say real nice to mm -hmm. suck them in. Yeah. And then I say to the whole audience, let another motherfucker get up and don't raise their fucking hand. <laughs> I say, I'm in the middle <laughs> of a motherfucking conversation do not get the fuck up no more unless you raise your hand. The crowd's like, oh my God, I can't believe it. Yeah. And I said, sir, you got you only got to go to the bathroom? They said, yes, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, give them a round of applause. They clap, and I let them go to the bathroom. But it's really a seminar, and I don't want you to miss nothing, so I'll hold your ass hostage. So I was actually on my shit yesterday when I was telling my girl chill. For yeah, 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 because I, I would have got it if I'd have saw her. Oh. If I, if I would have started that way, but the show didn't go that way. Yeah. See, because like I said, it was, um, my show was organic, so it wasn't even about that yesterday. But you did check the waitress. Yeah, she was talking too loud. Yeah. Yeah, I said, excuse me, can you talk a little low? She was a little too loud. Yeah. Yeah, I, like, I, I, I run a tight ship. Uh, yeah, you do. Yeah, I run a, a, that's my definition of being a man. And what happened with the one girl, the first one you got into it with the chubby girl, on, she was on your left right yes. here. Uh -huh. What was she, was she talking back to you? She was just talking back, but see, when a female is attracted to you, they think that's the way of getting your attention. Mm. Well, in actuality, all she had to do was wait and have a conversation with me after the show. So women have a horrible way of flirting with you mm -hmm. at the wrong fucking time. Like, <laughs> bitch, I'm on stage trying to get money. You fucking with these people's money and you're distracting me and I don't have time to tongue wrestle with you to go back and forth. But when they're under 30, mm. Mm. Not understanding. Even pre a, a woman's going to be watching this now. It's like, oh, what the fuck? Right. I mean, the kids under 30, they think we're... Um, trying to be rude or trying to boss you, you know, but there's rules to how you move through life and Preach. I, I find that I'm tired that we always have to explain ourselves on why you should act a certain way, but young, these, ki these young kids are sometimes raised by a young father or young mom that didn't teach them this. Um, you, you've been on stage with um, or in around Jay-Z, Lil Wayne, Keisha Cole, a bunch of stars. Mm -hmm. um, you, you said Jay-Z Never let Benny Siegel shine. Can you expound on that? Because Benny Siegel's really, to me, the coldest motherfucker on that label. Mm. 
Now, Benny Siegel's cold, but what I have found out that Damon Dash and them will only allow Benny Siegel to sell a certain amount of records. And then they would stop pushing them. Mm. See, because Jay-Z always had to be the man, so they never pushed him to be the guy he was. And then a lot of people don't know when you are on a record label, you only get two, three cents a fucking song. Mm -hmm. So unless you're out touring, you're not really making no money. That's why everything I've done since I was a, in the, got in this game, I owned it. Everything. I, I never worked for nobody. You know what I'm saying? So everything I did, I always raised the money to put it together. Um, I always did door deals. If I don't get a door deal, I won't work for you. Because mm. you're not going to give me a fucking salary. Mm. You know? I, I, and, and, and to see where I'm at now, to have bidding wars against comedy clubs to book me. Oh, uh, it's a beautiful fucking thing. Yeah. Man. Because if I ain't getting 90% at the door, I ain't doing it. Yeah. And I price the tickets. I, you can't, my tickets can't be $25. It can't be $20. It can't be $15. You're not going to devalue me. I know what I'm worth, and I know I can put the asses in seats. Definitely. So I get what I want, you know? And you only get so much money, so it's good to get the check, you know? That's mm -hmm. like, I, like, I like making money, but um, it's like, uh, America, you got to have a lot of money just because you got to go to war. Mm. I make a lot of money just because I got to go to war. Mm. And what that means is if my children need something, if I want to buy a woman something and it's not going to hurt me, um, that's my way of surviving. It gives me peace. You ever been to any of these weird Hollywood parties where you open the door and you see people doing the unthinkable? No, I don't go to Hollywood parties. Okay. Matter of fact, I don't even do parties. I, I, I make uh, special engagements where you got to pay me to show up. But I don't do parties. We talked yeah. about people wearing dresses. Um, mm -hmm. I suppose Malone was on the cover of Billboard yeah. magazine with the dress on. Um, Kid Cudi was on SNL mm -hmm. with the dress on. He said mm -hmm. he was paying homage to uh, Kurt Cobain. Mm -hmm. Dave Chappelle talked about what he felt like, I think, when he talked to Oprah a long time ago about what he thought was an agenda. You think it's an agenda? Um, I'm at the age now, and I've seen so much in my life that no matter what I say right now, it's not going to change anything. Right. So to really give an answer, I, I really don't give a fuck there no more. Yeah. Fuck them. Right. You want to wear a dress, you want to wear a skirt underneath that motherfucker, you want to have a dick in your ass, and you, <laughs> and you want to carry a dick with you. Listen, li I'm tired because nobody's listening, right? Fuck them. What was the most, um, you, you've been around so long, what was the, it's peaks and valleys, what was the most downtime in your career? Never had it. Never. The, the thing that um, people say about me the most, and because uh, I managed my own career, I've been consistent for 30 years. I never really had the highs, but I never had lows. It's always been consistent. What's the best piece of advice you received from a, a, a peer or a mentor? Um, Paul Mooney. Paul Mooney said, um, there's no substitute for experience. Mm. So, you know, you got to go out there and get it. And I pass that down to other comedians who um, feel like there's some magical bottle that you shake to become good overnight. You really got to put in 20, 30 years. Mm. And then you really ain't got to ask nobody. Because people ask that question because they think there's a, a shortcut. Mm -hmm. There ain't no shortcut. Um, have you ever been involved with a famous woman, R&B no, singer? No, don't actress? believe in that. You don't do that. No, uh, uh. I stay away from that because of the. Um, I feel artists is kind of weird, interesting. Then you become, you get into competition. Who's working more mm -hmm. than you're working? So I stay away from that. What's your number one stress reliever? Um, peace and quiet, being alone. Um. You have you have children. I know we, me and you talked about your son. I don't know how many sons you mm -hmm. have, but you got. Have you um, taught your sons the game? Yeah, they, it's in their DNA. Okay. See, because some people got to be taught the game. Then some people have in their DNA. L my boys wasn't really raised under the roof with me, mm -hmm. but we're close though. Mm -hmm. They got it in them, so I know they got it from. It's, it's in their DNA. The thing I have to do with the boys and girls does keep their emotions in check because most people have problems when they start dating. Mm -hmm. Most of your problems come in life is when you start fucking mm -hmm. and you get an emotional attachment that it don't work out with that person or that person controlling you and it can fuck you up. So I try to keep my kids in control about dating because the dating thing, like if you can have money but you got problems in a relationship, then you can have a relationship but don't have no fucking money. Mm -hmm. When my kids got change, I'm teaching them 
how to control their emotions. It's kind of hard, you know, because my daughters get fucked by somebody real good. It could be a fucking crazy situation. My son mm -hmm. um, fucked with beautiful women, you know what I'm saying? And the way a bitch, the way her hair smelled, the way her skin saw, mm -hmm. got the perfect titties in the world, the fattest ass, small waist, like, Depending on who you are, that could fuck with you. Oh, yeah. And, and, and everybody ain't built like me when it comes to that, right? Mm -hmm. So I've always had a bad bitch breathing on me my whole life. So, you know, I'm, I'm just used to um, beautiful women. Do I, do I get weak at the knees for a female? Hell, motherfucker, yeah. Mm. But I'm in control. Mm -hmm. T to the motherfucking K. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's, what's something that you learned recently that you wish you had knew when you were 30? Um... Nothing, fam. My, my, the universe has really um, plotted my life out perfectly. And what I learned at 30s really helped me where I'm at today. With the pain that I went through in my 30s really helped me where I'm at today because I really appreciate life. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. People always say, why do you get up so early? Because you just went to sleep. And I say, yo, I love life so fucking much. I don't want to miss a minute. So when I sleep three, four, five hours, it's like I slept all day. And when my body's tired, when, once I feel my body's got enough rest, I get up. Mm. I can't go back to sleep. I can't lay there no fucking more. I'm like more. that too, though. I got to go. Ooh, I got to go. Not, it was the first time I ever heard this phrase when Nas, uh -huh. on the record, uh, never sleep because sleep is the cousin of death. Yeah, right? but that's not how I move. That's mm -hmm. not, no, it's not, it's, it's not like that. That's, mm -hmm. the, that's not my motivation. Mm -hmm. My motivation is just the universe. I just love life. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, I worked hard to be in this room with you, you know? So I worked hard to stay at a nice hotel. I worked hard to drive the beautiful cars that I drive. I worked hard to stay in the nice hotels. So not, even though from that side you think it's all... Like, like you saw what I did. We had to do. We had to drive in that fucking snow mm -hmm. the other day. These are things I've done my whole life to say how bad do I want. Word. And then you have to say, so what do you want? Do you want to be on TV? Do you want movies? I don't really care about television. I really don't care about movies. You know, I care about businesses. So I own a lot of different businesses, and I stay low key. I don't move. I don't try to brag and share the world what I try to do. I'm my, uh, I'm my own boss, I'm my own man, I move a certain way, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, I saw somewhere that you said you saw Baby, Cash Money Baby, mm -hmm. by Seven Bentleys. Uh, did you see Baby? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, um, I was getting ready to do the movie Baller Blocking, uh -huh. and I um, was on the set, and we, me, him, Cash Money Millionaires, we was performing at the House of Blues, and... Um, Baby just got 30 million, you know? And what was so crazy, what, what people don't understand, that when Juvenile dropped back that ass up, that album sold so many albums, so, made so much money, that the, um, the advance that Universal gave Baby, they paid it back off one album. Wow. So everything they made from that moment on, they were in the black. Mm. Not in the red, in the black. Mm -hmm. So we hanging out one day, and Baby's taking the whole neighborhood shopping. He took care of a lot of people. And we stopped at the store. That motherfucker was getting mint, Bentley. So me and my homie was the guy, Ron Bird was his name. Mm -hmm. And me and Ron like, don't look at him. You know how you don't look at nobody? Mm -hmm. You know, you think they might look up. Right. You motherfuckers, take, hey, you turn your hair real quick. And um, for a moment, we really thought that nigga was going to get us a car. <laughs> and we didn't get that fucking car, though. But man, <laughs> it, baby, it, it wasn't like he, he didn't respect money. He just making so much of it that it don't hurt him. Mm -hmm. So I was there to witness that. Good dude. Yeah. Baby, good dude. Um, we mess with lyrical hip hop on this platform. So uh, I just want to ask you, who is your top five dead or alive? Um, my top five rappers. Um, I'm a fan of Lil Baby. Mm -hmm. I'm a little fan. I'm a fan of Kodak Black. Mm -hmm. I'm a fan of um, Money Bag Yo. Mm. Yeah, love his shit too. Um, um, then you got to put Jay-Z in there. Then the coldest line in the history of rap music was a young nigga from Compton, a nigga named Easy e <laughs> when that nigga says, so what about the bitch who got shot? Fucker. That line right there to me. <laughs> 
He says, "So what about the bitch who got shot? The fucker? You think I give a, a, a? You think I give a fuck about a bitch? I ain't a sucker. Yeah. <laughs> this is an autobiography of the E. And if you ever fuck with me, you get taken by a stupid cold brother who smother. Worry to the motherfucker. Stay out of Compton. <laughs> yeah, easy fucking. Easy. And you pay homage to Easy in your show, like you, all the time. It's just you got love for him all the time. Um, are you?" So you listen to Kodak Black and any, what about R and B on it? You listen to anything current on the R and B side right now? No, uh, the, uh, the, my R and B person now is Drake. Oh yeah, yeah. Cause Drake, you know, it sound like he rapping, but the but her motherfucker was saying some fly shit, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he put a little rap in there. Yeah. So I really enjoy that, yo. But yeah. if I had to go old school stylistics, mm -hmm. the moments, the temptations, Marvin Gaye, you know, I was listening to him on the plane. And he's talking about who's going to save the world mm. that's destined to die. Mm -hmm. And um, it helps, it, it takes me to a point where I wish I could put um, Elon Musk, um, my man from Microsoft. Bill Gates. Bill Gates, um, my man from um, the guys from Google. Mm -hmm. What's the other rich old white man? Bezos, Amazon. Amazon, Bezos, and the other guy in stocks. He's about uh, Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett. And we get them to understand how powerful they are to create their own government, mm -hmm. to save the world, take care of people. Mm. You know, because those five men alone could take care of the world. It's the kind of money that they have. And I'm not saying to make everybody rich. I mean, just to make everybody comfortable, medical insurance, things of that nature to make people happy, a place for um, mentally ill, people who um, are depressed, because people get depressed because they, I always say people become depressed because they look at somebody else's hand, mm -hmm. because people, most people don't play the hand that they dealt, right? Mm -hmm. So if you, if you play the hand that you dealt, you pretty much you could be satisfied with your life. Mm -hmm. But when you look at other people's hands to see how they play in their hand, you can get envy, you get jealous. If people learn how to control their emotions, become the relationships, they would have a little bit of peace of mind. Don't get me wrong, everybody in this room has emotions, right? Mm -hmm. Your heart get mad, you get upset, you get jealous of somebody. What I teach people is to control your emotions. Mm -hmm. So you're st still gonna have that. But control your emotions. It hurts. And it takes years of mental training and um, discipline to get there. It doesn't happen overnight, but um, it got, you gotta start from somewhere. And I always tell people, my job is to give you the information is up to you how you process it. Comedic living legend, T.K. Kirk. Mr. Powers, and it was funny, we roll in the car all this time. You came to my comedy show last night, and I never processed your name mm -hmm. in my head because I know so many people. Like, I never said Mr. Powers in my head. So the manager says to me, he said, T.K., who is Mr. Powers? For a minute, I was saying, "Who the fuck is Mr. Powers?" <laughs> like I, he, he kept talking to me, like, "Who the like who the fuck is Powers?" Right. And it made me apply your name in my head as a contact, so that I won't ever ever forget because your um, your leadership, the way I, I saw how you, I I made you a better man within a day. <laughs> yeah. Seen it? Yeah, yeah. Listen to me. I saw how you was moving <laughs> in one day. You adjust it quicker than a motherfucker. And I want you to know I observed okay. it. Mm -hmm. I wish you, know. you the best. And this shit is off the chain, Mr. Mike Powers. Thank you. Um, listen to me. Damn. To the crew, the staff, yeah. all that. They probably listen to me. You, <laughs> you saw him. T to the motherfucker K. Peace.